Anzac Cove, Chunuk Bayer, The Neck, Lone Pine, Suvla Bay, Simpson and the Donkey. To an Australian, these are like saying uh, Little Round Top or, or the Cornfield at Antietam. These are our, these are our uh, national these are our national battlefields almost. Uh, and these are all very famous uh, actions in the uh, Gallipoli campaign, which is what this video is going to be about. Uh, it's going to be quite long, so I appreciate you watching. So with the entry of Australia and New Zealand into the First World War, the uh, Australian Imperial Force and the New Zealand Expeditionary Force, was different, <laughs> had to be different, uh, both set out to Egypt and both took part in the action at Gallipoli. But before we get to Gallipoli, we have to go back and the, the intention, the, the reason Gallipoli is often cited as this, this big blunder is because it sort of wasn't really meant to happen. Um, the whole point was meant to be the Navy takes Constantinople, which was at that time still Constantinople, still is to a lot of people, myself included, but anyway. Um, the, the Navy was meant to, uh, to push the Straits of the Dardanelles, knock out all the artillery pieces alongside, and, and was then meant to take Constantinople, land troops, uh, knock the Ottomans out of the war, at least in the, from the central hub. Uh, that would cut them off from Germany. Uh, at this point, the Ottomans um, are allies with Germany. They're involved in the war. They're actively fighting. But uh, because of Bulgaria's neutrality, Germans either are going to have to invade Bulgaria or persuade Bulgaria over to their side. That will come in important later. Uh, so right now, the Ottomans and the Germans are sort of like two little islands separate from one another. Uh, like that. <laughs> but anyway. Um, and knocking out Constantinople would be a big plus. Uh, the Russians have actually got a giant cross uh, made up for the Hagia Sophia, uh, which is, of course, uh, originally a church and is now a mosque in, uh, in what is today Istanbul, Constantinople. So the Ottomans had actually planned to Sorry, let's do something. So the Ottomans had actually had cro a, a big cross uh, as a part of their southern army to uh, to place in Constantinople uh, to to reconvert this this mosque back into an Orthodox church. Uh, that was not to be. Uh, the Australians and New Zealanders ended up having to go ashore with other people. So let's let's get into why. So 17th of February, the British um, attempt to push the Straits of Dardanelles. So what they what they're attempting to do here is. Um, battleships, I think 19 or 20 battleships with cruisers and destroyers are going to sail down this, at most points about a mile wide, uh, flanked by artillery and knock out artillery positions and basically just brute force their way through to, to Constantinople. Uh, what ends up happening is the Turks move the artillery battalions around. They're very, very, they, so you're shelling a position, but 10 minutes ago they move the artillery out of that position and then they just bring it back once you've gone. Uh, and then they shelled you from positions you thought were empty and, and ships were getting damaged and um, very few sunk, but some did. Uh, and then, bang, off goes a, uh, a water mine and sinks a French battleship, killing 90% of the crew. About 70 or 80 out of 700 to 800 survive. Ma naval combat seems brutal. Um, the, yeah, it, it, a lot of the crew die in these things. Especially, we'll see it at Jutland. Um, I'm not going to cover Jutland, but Jutland, you see, you know, big explosions, big deaths. Uh, and a, a British cruiser is, is crippled, and then the British basically, um, they assume that the Ottomans are running out of ammunition, and so they keep pushing, and they bring up the uh, civilian merchant marine-style uh, minesweepers. And the minesweepers come forward and they start getting f under fire. The British realize that actually they're not really running out of ammunition. And they, they start to pull back. And uh, this is at the point where the British realize that we're not going to be able to force the Dardanelles with naval power. Uh, they try sending two submarines in. Both of them blown up by underwater mines. Which might, I must imagine piloting a submarine, a, a World War I submarine, remember. Uh, so no sonar, no radar, no nothing. Basically, you got a periscope, and that's your, <laughs> that, That's basically it. Through a friggin' literal underwater minefield, uh, must be probably one of the worst things you could possibly do in a submarine. Uh, both both hit mines, both were killed. Uh, an Australian submarine would actually sneak through later on, but we'll get to that. Um, so the decision was made to land British and French troops at the Hellas. We're not going to get into that, just for the purposes of this. 
Uh, there were British and French troops landing at basically here at the Hellas on sort of the tip of, of Gallipoli. Uh, Australian troops would be landing here at, uh, at Anzac Cove. And, um, and yeah, Australian and New Zealand troops would land at Anzac Cove. Now, uh, before we get into the landings themselves, we should talk about some events prior. So there's some interesting things here. Uh, air, air reconnaissance is a big part of this campaign. Uh, it probably saves quite a lot of people's lives. It definitely saves thousands of, of Anzac lives. Costs quite a few Turk lives, but we'll get to that later. Uh, the landings delayed for weeks because the air, um, the the weather is not conducive to uh, airborne reconnaissance. British are doing this with seaplanes. The Ottomans have put together the very first Ottoman air force of like four German reconnaissance planes. Uh, these planes were considered like obsolete old planes three or four years after the f first planes were invented. Like these are these are planes are relatively new and these suck for being relatively new. These are like buying a, a 2005 car in 2020. You know, these are like sort of, it was top of the line. Now it's sort of trash. And um, remember this is pre, like planes aren't dog fighting in the air. It's, it's literally just flying over the camera taking photos. You might have a pistol or, or a rifle or something, but you're not seriously dogfighting with one another. And so the, the landings get delayed. Um, but before we go into that, let's look at the makeup of the um, troops which are going to be landing uh, at Gallipoli. So the MEF, the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force, uh, it was going to be called the Constantinople Expeditionary Force, but Kitchener was very keen on it being called the Constantinople Expeditionary Force. <laughs> but the generals decided that it was a little on the nose to call it the Constantinople Expeditionary Force, so they, uh, they persuaded him to call it the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force. It was made up of the 29th Division. So the, the 29th Infantry Division was made up of 20 battalions from all over the UK, Ireland, Scotland, uh, Wales, and England. And yes, yeah, so 20 battalions of them. Then there were the 20 Anzac battalions. Uh, first, <laughs> then there was the Marine Division made up of 12 Marine battalions from the Royal, Royal Marines. And then the Anzac divisions. And I've got the Anzac divisions written down here, so I'll just quickly look over. The first Australian brigade uh, was made up of four battalions from New South Wales. The second Australian brigade was made up of four battalions from uh, Victoria. And the, four, the third Australian brigade was Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia, Northern Territory, South Australia. So basically everyone else was making up the, the third. And that's the first Australian division. Um, the second division is a, an Australian uh, New Zealand mixed division. We're going to get to that in a sec. I just want to talk about the first Australian division's commander, um, Major General Sir William Thorsby Bridges. Um, Major General Bridges is what he's, what he's most known as. Uh, he's very famous for being um, the only identified uh, soldier of the First World War buried in Australia. Uh, he was killed at Gallipoli. He was shot in the femoral artery in the leg with a sniper uh, several weeks after this. Uh, we'll just cover that now. Uh, he, yeah, his horse was also the only horse brought back to Australia. Uh, there's a bunch of reasons why uh, quarantining, and I've mentioned before. Uh, anyway, uh, so, uh, Major General Bridges, um, he was, <laughs> he's got a quite, he's got a very interesting story. Uh, he was born in Scotland, his family moved around a lot, he ended up in Canada when he was about a teenager, joined a Canadian, uh, the Canadian Military College, and then became the first person to ever drop out of the Canadian Military College when he moved to Australia. His mother was from here. And so he came over here, he had to actually pay a fine to, to leave the college early. And um, then he just started working for the the New South Wales Road Department, so for some reason building roads in 1884. And then 1885, when they put together the Sudan Expedition, he went forward and said, look, can I join the New South Wales Army? And they said, sure, here's, here's a lieutenancy, um, we'll train you on the job. So <laughs> instead of going to this big fancy academy, he literally just walked it from, from uh, Narambimbi to, to Sydney and then just got a lieutenancy. <laughs> And he didn't end up going overseas. Uh, the, the, the expeditionary force to the Sudan had already left. He didn't miss much. Uh, in fact, he probably, the only thing he missed was uh, disease and, and probably getting himself quite sick. Um, he would then spend uh, a year in training. He would eventually become um, basically the head of the New South Wales Artillery Training School. He had a big part in setting up the Royal Military College in Duntroon. He went over as an advisor in South Africa. 
and he eventually found himself as basically the head of the AIF when they were sent overseas. Uh, he had done some liaising with the uh, divisional commander from New Zealand, who we're going to talk about next. But um, uh, uh, yes, so Major General Sir, Sir William Bridges uh, was a, a sort of a key figure in the early Australian um, setting the foundations for the early Australian officer corps of the military uh, going forward. He's the one who chose the location of Duntroon. Well, Kitchener sort of chose it, and he confirmed that it was a good idea. Duntroon is basically our Sandhurst over here. Um, and the cheeky Canadians have actually got his name on their Royal Military College like honours list. He, he dropped out. You can't take that. Take, you can't claim that. He didn't even graduate from there anyway. Um, his, his, his story is so Australian too. It's like, what have you been doing for the last six months? I've been working for the roads, building roads. Oh, it's like, cool. Yeah, you could be an officer in the artillery, the most, you know, the most technical branch of the army that we have at this point. Why don't you just go over there and get uniform or just train you on the job? You know, it's, it's a very Australian way to get a job. And he just sort of, okay, and then he ends up being basically the boss of this, this thing after a couple of years. Very, very colonial Australian um, way to go about things. Anyway, next we go on to the, the Australian, the Kiwi Aussie Brigade. Uh, Kiwi is a word for, for New Zealanders. They have this stupid, dumb little bird with no feather, with, you can't fly. It's just a useless little thing that runs around the ground. Um, Australia also has a bird that, f that can't fly. It's called a cassowary. Uh, if you go anywhere near its territory, it will mercilessly hunt you down and gut it with these giant claws. Uh, these are violent, psychopathic killers. And um, these are little dweeby birds. So we call them kiwis. And um, uh, there's also some other nicknames. Cockroaches for New South Wales uh, because of the state of origin teams. Uh, Queensland are cane toads. And Tasmanians are... Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a... It's a um, Hillbilly, uh, sort of, anyway. And then Victorians and Mexicans, because they're south of the border. So um, if you wanted to get, a, you know, native about it, you would say, you know, the first Australian Brigade was, was cockroaches and the second was Mexicans, <laughs> which is actually what I've got written on my, my notes here so I can keep track of it all. Um, so the New Zealand and the Australian Brigade, uh, the 4th Australian Division was mixed. And the, the Australian division that they sent over was composed of the Auckland Brigade, the Canterbury Brigade, the Otago Brigade, and the Wellington, uh, sorry, Battalion, sorry. The, uh, the Auckland Battalion, the Canterbury Battalion, the Otago Battalion, and the Wellington Battalion. So, uh, 16 Australian battalions, four New Zealand battalions. Uh, that is an exact ratio of how the two countries are, by the way. Uh, New Zealand's got about four and a half, maybe five. Australians about 20 million people. So it, it's about a quarter of the size which is yeah, ratio-wise, basically perfect. Um, the New Zealanders were led by uh, uh, Major General Godley. Major General Godley was much more formal with his education, being uh, you know, a British officer for a long, long time. He actually went to a military academy and graduated. Um, it's, it's funny how they both end up in the same position. He f drops out of military school and then goes and works for the road department and then just sort of gets his way into a job on, you know, just by... by just being good at it and just bludgeoning his way through. Uh, and, uh, and Major General Godley studies and works his ass off and has to, basically he ends up getting this and he thinks it's a demotion, but we get that anyway. So he, uh, he graduates from Sandhurst, gets uh, put into a battalion with one of his relatives. He ends up um, studying, this would be, it's, it's quite weird the things that pop up. He ends up studying mounted infantry tactics. And because he studies mounted infantry tactics, he gets himself posted to, the, to uh, Rhodesia one of the Matabili Wars, and he operates with the BSAC, the British South Africa Company, um, which would basically turn, uh, the BSAC would basically, they use the BSAP, the British South Africa Police, which was a Rhodesian regiment up until the, the 1979. And the most popular video on this channel, by the way, is the Rhodesian um, bush war video that I did. So yeah, he was involved in the Matabili War with the Rhodesians, uh, and then he would find himself uh, fighting against the Boers in the South Africa, as part of the Special Services Battalion, which is basically the British sort of proto um, Ministry of Defence, which was the World War II Commando Department. Basically, he was his job was to raise irregular mounted infantry, uh, and he ended up commanding. Uh, he was a major at this time, and he ended up commanding um, the Rhodesian Battalion. And he would organise things like uh, the Bushveld Carbineers. He helped them uh, get set up and helped them do some things. So he was he was quite important for. Um, for this sort of old and new warfare coming together. He was, he was sort of quite important for these, um, 
these he, he got on quite well with these backwater colonials is what I'm saying and so when the New Zealand army basically said uh, it would be cool yeah we'd actually like some uh, some British officers to come over he was looking at a promotion to a lieutenant colonel take over a battalion and they offered him a major general's promotion and he very very much didn't want to take it because he's like lieutenant colonel of a British regiment major general of, of New Zealand <laughs> like, so it was sort of a bit of a thing but he eventually accepted and when he arrived in New Zealand he basically said everything you're doing is wrong and I'm going to fix it and he actually made it quite good he's um he's probably the only person in the world who actually made some very very good plans for World War One uh, you always hear about people making these terrible plans but uh, but Major General Godley made some quite good plans uh, he for instance he divided the Pacific into two zones. Uh, the German islands in the Pacific were divided into uh, New Zealand controlled and Australian controlled. So the New Zealands took care of German Samoa and the Australians took care of German New Guinea. And so basically he, he coordinated with the Australians that as soon as war was declared, the New Zealanders would immediately launch an attack on, on German Samoa and the Australians would immediately launch an attack on German New Guinea. Uh, German New Guinea is, was the Battle of Bitapika. Um, the Australians basically took a, a radio position, shut the whole Germans down in that area. Uh, the New Zealanders did basically the same. So because of him, bang, bang, Germans were knocked out in the South Pacific quite quickly, which is always good. Uh, he also organized the creation of this mixed division here with uh, an Australian and, a New and an Australian, uh, an Australian and New Zealand and an Australian brigade so that it could be mixed together and, and immediately just sent over. Um, so he was, he was quite for, he was very thinking far ahead in terms of, um, in terms of, we need to put together a thing to just go immediately. So let's make up a bunch of paper battalions, paper divisions for both countries. And when the real divisions get raised, we'll just slot them on in. This is in sort of 1910, 1911. We'll just, whatever, A, B, C, D. And then when they get raised, we'll just replace the names and then that plan goes ahead. So he was very good at, at just getting stuff done quickly. And uh, Major General Godley would go on to, uh, to bigger and better things, but that's not what we're talking about today. Oh, I should also mention he was um, part of part of his his whole thing of um, Major General Godley's whole thing of of um, raising new things and and creating these new ideas was he was at Mafeking. He was also Kimberley, but he was also at Mafeking with uh, Baden Powell. Baden Powell helped found well he founded the Scouts, and so Major General Godley played a role in the battle which would go on to found the Scout movement, um, which is obviously still continues to this day. So uh, yes, Godley is is very interesting character in this sort of uh, this this gentleman pioneer sort of planning expert type guy, someone who can who can sit down and plan something out and then go out into a field and do it. Um, there are very few people like this. Uh, I can think of a few people from the Second World War in the commando department who are quite good at planning an operation and then going out and doing it. But very, very few people um, have the capabilities of planning out core level actions and then going down and doing some battalion level work and then coming back and planning an entire guerrilla campaign and then coming in and basically running the defense of a city. So it's, uh, it's, it's, he seems to be quite an elastic type of guy, very good at, at basically everything that he's doing. Um, so yes. So who are they up against? Well, the Turks. At this point, uh, doing this thing where they basically bring in German commanders. So the Turks were led, uh, had five divisions under Colonel von Sanders. And Colonel von Sanders, um, German sent over, quite good guy, quite a... Uh, um, luckily for a German, if you're a German <laughs> command figure in World War One, you better hope you die before 1933. Okay, I'm just going to put that out there right now. Uh, he passed away in 1929, and so he's not stained. Uh, generally, if you're a German high command figure and you live past 1933, with few exceptions, you end up getting tainted with that whole, you know, the thing that happened in 1933 in Germany. Um, although, uh, Paul von lethal vorbeck who we're definitely going to talk about at some point on this channel, um, is probably the, the major exception to that, but anyway. Uh, he, the, the main division we're going to talk about here is the... So the main Turkish division that we're concerned about for the Anzacs is the 19th Kamal Division, led by Kamal, um, Mustafa Kamal, who would later be called Ataturk, which means father of the Turks. He, he basically led the Young Turk movement to, um, in a coup in, in, in the Ottoman Empire, which then became Turkey. Um, almost all Australians will just say Turk when we talk about the, um, the actions at Gallipoli. So I'm going to say Turk because that's just, that's just what is said. Um, 
so yes, Mustafa Kemal with the 19th, which is, I'm just going to say Mustafa Kemal. I mean the 19th uh, Turkish Ottoman division it was stationed sort of around the area that we would call Anzac Cove, and the uh, General Sanders' position was he was going to defend both sides of the Dardanelles, uh, and it was only about a mile wide at, at a lot of points, so you could cross it with small rowboats or small tugboats, or you know he could get troops from one side to the other relatively quickly. And so his plan was basically spread the forces out, find where they are, hold them, bring reserves, crush them on the beach. That was, it, which is a relatively sound thing when you think about it. Uh, the British plan was basically just land on the beach, go inland, take your objectives, and then, um, I don't know, uh, magical warriors will ride out on ghost horses, and then somehow that means we get to Constantinople. There was no real plan here. It was basically like, we're going to take this part of the Gallipoli Peninsula, and then break it off and then like build a Death Star out of it and drive it in a constant. There's, there's no plan here. The plan is basically like, we're going to do this and then the Turks are just going to go, Bleh, and then we're just going to walk over them. Um, the, 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 if it, the reason a lot of people say that, they're well, like, oh no, this plan could never have worked. It's because this wasn't meant to be the plan. Um, the plan was the Navy goes in, infantry come after. Right now, it's, it's now turned into the infantry now need to take all this place to get to the point uh, sorry, the infantry now need to take all the land up to the point when they would normally start being deployed to take Constantinople. So it's basically like, instead of being flown up to the last 100 feet of the mountain, you have to climb so you can plant the flag on the top of Everest and, you know, be a hero. You now have to climb all the way from the bottom of Mount Everest up to the top with the supplies and training that you need to climb the last 100 feet. So it's basically like, <laughs> you basically, you've, you've gone from a quite a good idea to a completely insane idea. And everyone knew it was insane. Everyone knew it was uh, untenable. But they basically were just hoping that some miracle would happen or they would get there and then they'd be able to get more troops later on. All you had to do was hold. So at this point, it's basically just a position of get in there and don't all be killed. <laughs> we just need to, to do something here. We need to push forward and we'll see what happens. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. Uh, it's, it's not a great thing when you realize that your test is actually a bunch of people dying, but as military operations got at this time. It's actually one of the smarter ones. Uh, what the Russians did in the um, Tannenberg Forest where they like lost whole armies. Uh, this, this is not one of the biggest blunders of World War One, as it's often put. Anyway, let's get into what actually happened at the landings at Anzac Cove. So, on the night of the 24th of April, uh, a relatively unknown uh, New Zealand lieutenant that totally won't become a really, really, really important figure in World War II, uh, named Freiburg, uh, swam ashore from the from a ship, as in he actually like got in the water and then swam uh, over to the opposite side of the Dardanelles, put a bunch of flares out, and then started firing guns and and lighting off flares and setting off uh, artillery pieces on uh, like artillery shells and all sorts of stuff on the beach. To, uh, think the, to trick the Turks into thinking they were landing over there. One guy did this, one guy. Um, uh, Freiburg, you, you, you may have heard of him if you know sort of anything about the Australians and New Zealanders in World War II. He ended up becoming the basic overall commander of the New Zealand forces. Uh, he led the defense of Crete. He led the actions around uh, the battles of Thermopylae in Greece when the Australians and New Zealanders fought side by side in Greece against the the uh, Liebstandarte, the, the SS Liebstandarte Adolf Hitler, uh, armoured division that came down. Uh, Freiburg became actually quite an important uh, New Zealand figure in World War Two. But uh, yeah, he actually swam ashore on, on April 24th and set up a bunch of stuff. Uh, then at four o'clock in the morning on April 25th, the first Australian and New Zealand troops landed at Anzac Cove. Uh, now there's a lot of, if you're an Australian, see a lot of things I'm talking about are things that every Australian will already know. So every Australian knows they landed a mile to the north, and that somehow had some impact in some way. It's people often say, "Well, all the terrain was all different," so they'd never been there in the first place. All they saw was like blurry 1915 level photographs of like a thing, and then here's where you go from here. And it, the terrain, terrain being different, I don't think is, is that big a deal. The issue was the terrain was just rough, and the terrain was rough everywhere. And they, they hit a particularly rough bit, climbed up sheer cliffs. Uh, they came under fire as soon as they landed, but they managed to sort of get inland and push them off. The problem was 
uh, particularly the Australians. The Australians sort of surged forward and got mixed up and then turned around and, and, and sort of pushed forward and scattered. Uh, whereas New Zealanders sort of blobbed up and pushed in uh, at a slower pace whereas the Australians sort of rushed forward in, in dribs and drabs and this would happen a, a fair bit in the Gallipoli campaign. Uh, the New Zealanders seemed to advance slowly and cautiously. The Australians just sort of sp- just splash everywhere and end up getting themselves in a lot of trouble or they splash everywhere and they ended up doing something amazing and then you know you can't follow up because you're all scattered uh, so by 10 o'clock by 8 o'clock in the morning most of the Anzacs are on the shore um, there was also a, a, a Ceylon uh, planters uh, which were white um, white people from what is today Sri Lanka um, I don't know why they seem to be attached to the Anzac Corps commanders as like <laughs> as like a core Battalion that they can float around. I'm not sure why they were there, but they were technically involved, which means the Anzac bata- the Anzac Corps, um, which is redundant, but anyway, the Anzacs were technically the largest part of this. 20 battalions on the British side to 21 Anzac battalions. Uh, there are also nine French battalions, most of them colonial and, and Senegalese. Uh, there was two Zouaves too, which is always cool. Zouaves are awesome. There's a Zouave. They did have that crazy uniform in World War One too. Uh, those things went ashore at Gallipoli. My, my goodness, those Zouaves are just completely out of control. I love Zouave uniforms. Um, anyway, so by 10.30, the Turks have um, basically realized what's going on. Uh, they know where it's happening, they know what's happening. They hit the, the, the British and the French at Hellas particularly hard, but the end, we're not going to focus on Hellas. Uh, Hellas is basically the British and French landings, the British and French operations. Uh, we're going to focus mainly on the Anzacs purely because this is going to be a long enough video as it is and I'm not particularly keen on going into all the different like 17 or so battles that happened at Hellas. Um, Anzac is where the, the Australian legend is. It's not at Hellas. It's, a, it's, a, it's at Anzac and, and the areas around Anzac we're going to talk about here. So the Anzacs pushed forward and they managed to get a two kilometer perimeter uh, suffering 2,000 casualties. So one casualty per meter of the perimeter which is uh, not good, <laughs> but uh, you know, you take what you can get. They at least had a perimeter. Uh, they were clinging to the rocks, is a phrase you often hear, clinging to the rocks, uh, literally in some points, like as in you had a cliff behind you and you were trying to dig in this rocky soil with your, your crappy entrenching tool. You were quite literally on the rocks, on the cliffs. Uh, and so these guys started digging in and the Turks counterattack, throw them back, mass casualties and, um, they basically just pound into one another for the next two, three days. Uh, on the evening of the first night, the two generals to get, get together, the Australian... So on the night of the 25th, the day of the Anzac landings, the two divisional commanders get together and they make a unanimous decision that this has gone incredibly badly. Uh, this has completely failed. We need to pull out now. Um, this is when people always say this are like lions led by donkeys thing. The Both divisional commanders wanted to leave. They were both in... The, the main waves in the combat. Um, it was very hard to not be in combat at Gallipoli. Um, the, the major generals were on the ground in combat saying, we need to leave, this is untenable. Uh, they take it up with their, the overall commander, who agrees with them, by the way. The overall commander does agree. So often you'll hear people say this whole, like, British High Command wouldn't let them pull out the first day. Uh, the Navy was the ones who said they couldn't pull out because they couldn't pull out. Uh, the enemy was well aware that they were in contact if the Navy tried to pull them out now, they would just be swarmed and killed. True. Uh, very true. So, yeah, it was basically a point of, we really need to get out of here. We just can't. So what can you do for us now? And what they could do for them now was basically bring on the light horse over from Egypt and send telegrams back to Australia saying, um, nothing's gone wrong, everything's fine, but um, if you could send more people, that'd be awesome. You could send more men. I know that we need more men because we didn't waste all the ones you just gave us. But uh, more men would always be good. <laughs> you know, one of those those classic, like, everything's fine, but please hurry, sort of smile and, and freaking out eyes. Yeah. And so the Australians and New Zealanders dug in uh, around some places that would be quite famous. Chunuk Bayer, uh, Shrapnel Gully, um, uh, Lone Pine. These are these are names that resonate particularly with uh, with Australians and New Zealanders. Um, the, the area that these guys were digging in would have been rock. It would have, it's actually quite a lot like Australia temperature wise. Uh, it's riddled with flies, which is going to come up later. Flies that literally just get everywhere. Um, if, you, if you don't live somewhere where there's a lot of flies, 
I don't think you can quite understand how much of a ridiculous pest they are, uh, especially here in Australia. Uh, in Gallipoli, very similar climate. So if you open your mouth, flies. Uh, if, you, if you spill water somewhere, flies. If you get a cut, flies. If you have some kind of food for any amount of time, like one millisecond uncovered, flies. Um, latrines, flies. And then those flies land on your food, then you get dysentery. Uh, flies were an insane problem in Gallipoli um, for both sides and uh, it's grisly but if we're gonna get to a point where there's thousands of dead bodies sitting there flies and then the flies come bring the diseases back it's gonna get nasty so uh, fair warning so five days later the uh, Colonel Monash was leading one of the Australian battalion uh, Australian battalions he would later go on to lead the Australian Corps when they were united in 1918. But for now, uh, Colonel Monash basically gets a bunch of, is ordered to, to launch a counterattack uh, against the Turks uh, five days after the initial landings. It basically fails, but it fails in a way that sort of shows both sides that they're not going anywhere. Uh, the counterattack is, shows the Turks that the Australians and New Zealanders aren't leaving. Uh, it shows them that they're not trying to pull out uh, the Turks, when they originally see this counterattack coming in, are like, oh, sweet. Uh, they must be pulling out everywhere else, surge forward. They hit the counterattack, bounce off one another, and then everywhere else they surge forward and get driven back. So it was sort of that this, this counterattack was the point of, okay, we're not going to be able to just walk over these guys, and the Australians and New Zealanders realize that we're not going to be able to push out of here. So then the attention turned to what can we do in the Hellas to, to win this? Uh, the Anzacs and the, the Anzacs basically can can just sit at Anzac Cove and be a pest <laughs> to the to the Turks. Uh, they can force the Turks to bring divisions in. If we put more reinforcements there, the Turks are going to have to put even more divisions at Anzac. And so they basically started building up troops at Anzac and then siphoning some divisions off to come and attack. Um, in early May, there were Australian New Zealand divisions brought... Uh, b battalions, I keep saying divisions, sorry. Australian and New Zealand battalions were siphoned off to the Hellas. Uh, where the New Zealanders cautiously advanced and the Australians just Leroy Jenkins charged um, and they both came very close to the goal but the British got the absolute sh just crap kicked out of them with shelling and the French were just so exhausted from having to march from one end to the other and back again that uh, basically the whole thing was called off as soon as the, Australian, the New Zealanders had crept forward in the position the Australians had basically just pelted it there and then the attack gets called off because the planning's all messed up and so on. Yes. So that's sort of end of end of April, start of May. So that was the sort of end of April, start of May. We have Anzac quite well defended. Uh, troops being sent over to the Hellas to, to reinforce, but the attacks in the Hellas are basically stagnating. Um, although, for, for just for reference, there was a, a, a British battalion that was taken from 1,000 men down to 300 in one attack. And a Turkish regiment, which uh, contacted uh, Mustafa Kemal and said, we are out of ammunition. And he says, I don't want you to fight, I want you to die. And they got wiped out into a man. Um, so the around Anzac, the, the fighting basically devolved into classic World War I trench fighting. Trench raids, uh, grenade attacks. We'll get into grenades in a minute. Sniping, this is where, um, this is a general... Was it Bridges? This is where General Bridges is killed. He's sniped in the leg. He's the only Australian sent home to be buried. The only other Australian soldier buried at home is the unknown soldier. Uh, there's actually a mass Australian and mass New Zealand graves at, uh, at Gallipoli, which are maintained by the Turkish government. There's actually quite a good relationship between the two, but I'll get into that at the very end. Uh, so sniping, uh, trench, uh, underground mining first starts to pop up. Uh, the Australian tunneling regiments, uh, Australian tunneling companies won't be started for another year or two yet, but they, the idea is already there. Um, the Turks start tunneling, the Australians start counter-tunneling, the Turks detonate a mine at one point and rush forward and attack. Uh, so the, the, these Western Front-style trench warfare is starting to happen in Gallipoli. Uh, although at the time, of course, they wouldn't have known this. They wouldn't have known this is what you're supposed to do in trench warfare. Um, people talk about trench warfare as if, like, well, they didn't know how to use the tools they had, therefore they had to fight trench warfare. It's the complete opposite. They knew exactly how to use the tools they had, and the tools they had were friggin' nice. Uh, machine guns are awesome, if you, uh, from the point of view of a, of a general who wants to not have the enemy advance, a machine gun is a fantastic tool. You just go like this, and then hundreds of people die over there. 
you go like that and just hundreds of people drop down dead so the problem was people knew how to do stuff too well people knew how to use these machine guns and knew how to sight them properly uh, sniping was now a thing telescopic sights were getting much much better much cheaper much easier to use uh, no longer did you have these giant civil war scope things like this now you could get quite compact scopes for the time so sniping has become a thing the australians are sitting men on a beach making uh with jam tins so basically you think of a tin of peaches or a tin of baked beans once you eat it you fill it full of nails and rocks and all sorts of nasty crap put explosives in it put a thing and then get a literal fuse like a cowboy would use and then like jam it in there and, and waterproof it and then sort of t- you know fix it all up there's your grenades uh so when you hear about grenades at gallipoli it's a literal tin with like rocks and stuff in it with explosive in it that you light with a lighter or a match or a cigarette and you chuck it um it's quite common for these things to be chucked back because they put such a long fuse on it that you can throw it back and then you can throw it back again there's stories of these things being thrown back two or three different times um but yeah the, the these jam tin grenades as they were called they were um <laughs> they were a little bit dodgy but that's that's what you had so basically when people say you know all oh, the western front devolved into this and everywhere else seemed to be this big mobile war that's not really true so mid-may may 18th uh, british reconnaissance aircraft remember operating all the time and they notice a giant turkish build-up near anzac 40 to 50 thousand men we now know it's it's about 47 48 thousand people um against 12 thousand anzacs uh these these turks are massing <laughs> the guys in the plane uh, remember radio wireless radio transmission isn't isn't sort of a thing at this point so you have to take the photos land get them to the commanders and then explain to them there is a giant turkish build-up about to hit you tomorrow and so the australians new zealanders were ready for this they decided their guns properly uh, everything was ready they knew how to do a counter battery at the same time and they slaughtered the turks when they came on oh did they get them 10,000 Turkish casualties to about 2,000 Anzac casualties. Uh, 3,000 Turkish dead just cut down in this massive counterattack. It was so bad, uh, again, the flies, that after five days, the, 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 uh, sorry, the, the Turkish divisional commander and the Mustafa Kemal, and, uh, and it got so bad that after five days, the the brigade commanders and the divisional commanders all got together and they said look we need to bury these guys i don't give you know, i don't care what you guys are doing <laughs> these bodies need to be in the ground and uh, they both came up with the truce and they both came out chatted with one another traded smokes well turks probably wouldn't have had a lot of stuff see the turks being being for some muslim nation they wouldn't have had alcohol to trade or, or a lot of particularly nice stuff that the uh, the australians would have been looking for especially in france but anyway buried all the dead thousands of dead bodies just thousands of them sitting there bloated with maggots and flies and disgusting in the heat and they would have decayed awfully and yeah terrible um one of the biggest images we have of gallipoli is just is just dead bodies rotting in the sun everywhere and um we're going to get into an action later on which is literally them stepping on the bodies of their dead comrades fighting hand to hand at night in this thing and um, one of the classic phrases is the best we could do was not step on the face of our best friend who had just died so it's uh, yeah they're finding a Gallipoli gets real nasty real quick um, big flat spaces you can run over or giant rocky mountain things where you can't really attack through uh, those are your two options and it's uh, it's never a good one so in August the last big action at Gallipoli happened at the very start of August the British decided they were going to land troops at Suvla Bay and uh, by landing troops at Suvla Bay they hoped that they could push through smash past and then relieve Anzac to be able to overwhelm the stuff Kamal take back the rest of this and then push on to this mythical thing that was never going to happen uh, anyway so to cover the attacks at Suvla uh, the New Zealanders attack at Chunuk Bayir Chunuk Bayir you may have you may have not heard of it but you may have seen um, miniatures about this Chunuk Bayir is the thing that Peter Jackson did that giant a 54 mil recreation of uh, at the 3054 mil miniatures at the um at the uh, wellington museum you can actually go see that it takes up the entire room so that's uh, that's chunuk bayir uh and as <laughs> so chunuk bayir was a distraction for suvla bay and then to distract the turks from chunuk bayir the australians launched an attack at lone pine uh, oh sorry I, I forgot to mention 
Uh, back in Monash's attack, um, a very, very famous person was killed. Uh, Simpson. Simpson and his donkey is an Australian legend. Uh, sorry to put this out of place, but I need to talk about it. Simpson and his donkey is something every Australian kid knows about Simpson and his donkey. Simpson was a, uh, a stretcher bearer in the medical corps, and he would take a donkey out and bring troops back on the donkey. And he would do this day after day, day after day, and then one day the donkey came back without Simpson. And that's that's basically the the, the story. <laughs> but the, it's a much more, it's a very powerful story of this, this one guy who was just Constantly just going in and out, in and out, bringing back the wounded. Um, uh, there's calls for him to be given a VC. I don't particularly agree with that. Um, the things you have to do to win a VC are, are, are much higher than that. But uh, he was given he was given a mention to dispatches, and I believe he got a DSO. But yes, um, Simpson and the donkey is, is a very famous story that every Australian knows. So that took place during Monash's counterattack. He was uh, he was killed in Shrapnel Gully at that point. Anyway, on to Lone Pine. Lone Pine is probably the most famous of all the battles. Um, and Lone Pine is, is especially famous because here in Australia we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of Lone Pines, as in uh, cuttings and seedlings taken from the actual pine. There was basically a pine tree on a, on a ridge by itself, hence Lone Pine. You know. And uh, a lot of us, uh, the Kwanam Water State College High School, where I went to high school, has a Lone Pine there, a cutting from Lone Pine. Uh, there are many, many Australian towns which will have Lone Pines, all taken from this one tree over in over in uh, Turkey somewhere. So yeah, it's a it's a very very important uh, cultural battle for us. And uh, this is the battle that gives Australia that um, that terrible terrible um, colonial complex that everyone seems to get. Uh, the only people who don't get it are the Americans. But the colonial complex is this thing where you take a bunch of untrained soldiers, throw them into a bad situation, they end up completely crushing the enemy, and then they get the feeling that they're invincible. And you can take untrained Australians or untrained Canadians. Canadians really get done with this too. And then, okay, so basically the, the way it works for the uh, Australians is after after Lone Pine, Australians are such badasses, all you'd have to do is give an Australian a rifle and he's basically like a special forces guy, right? And then World War II, this prevailing thing is, is coming along. So, oh, we'll just send the militia to New Guinea where they get curb stomped back to within 20 miles of Port Moresby. And then it's like, oh, that's right, okay, you do actually train soldiers, you can't just give men rifles because we're not superheroes. Uh, you just because you happen to be born in a certain place doesn't make you a super soldier. Uh, the Canadians get this complex in 1812 when they beat back the three American invasions in the War of 1812. Uh, due more to the American incompetence than Canadian brilliance. And uh, they don't lose it until the Western Front of, of 1916, 1915, 1916, when they go into battle with basically a target rifle uh, very accurate, very crap, <laughs> blows up in your face sometimes, the Ross rifle, uh, a target rifle, and yeah, that's sort of when the Canadians lose their, their mythical image of you can just give a Canadian a rifle and they're just a soldier. So this is this, the battle I'm about to talk about is where Australia gets this, this, this colonial, um, colonial soldier mindset from. Um, so the Australians had been doing some very busy work at Lone Pine. Uh, so are the Turks. Uh, the Turks had basically got a trench line up near Lone Pine and the Australians had been tunneling. But they weren't tunneling to build a mine, they were literally just tunneling trenches. So instead of running across no man's land, you could walk underneath it and then come up and go across. Very smart. Um, not smart if you get shelled, but it's a quite a smart idea um, to do on in somewhere like Gallipoli. You wouldn't have got away with this on the Western Front, but in Gallipoli you could do it. Uh, so. Uh, two battalions, one light horse, one regular infantry, uh, go over the top slash under the ground and assault the Turkish positions on the 6th of August. Um, there, there is a big bombardment and this basically, the, at, this, at this point of the war, you don't really know what to do when you're being bombarded. Uh, what you do when you're being bombarded is you hide and then when the bombardment stops, you race back to the fire step and immediately man the fire step and, and start killing the enemy who are running, running at you. But at this point of the war, it's like, the bombardment's over, they're going to do a second bombardment, what's going to happen now? And so the Australians managed to actually get to the Ottoman trenches without any real things happening to them. Uh, the Australians had been super reinforced, guys. They had all the best equipment. They had four whole Vickers guns per battalion. Uh, up from the, the two standard ones, they had double the amount of Vickers guns, which is probably like less than half of what they needed. But um, they had 1,200 grenades for 2,000 men. It was insane amount of grenades, grenades everywhere. And um, you really you look at like D-Day in World War II and these guys shoving grenades in their thing and they got two or three on the outside. 
you're talking about one per well, two grenades per three people sort of thing um, and the next day they get resupplied with another thousand which is yeah great but when the Australians get to the trenches they see something that was not on the photographs they see these giant logs on top of all the trenches with these holes cut in them so they get there and like how do we actually get into this trench because we can't lift the log up it's too high and then suddenly bang 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 machine guns start going off the Turks start shooting up at them through the little holes in the logs so suddenly you're now stuck completely in the open. The Turks are now counter battery firing on your position basically. And you can't get into these trenches. So some troops just start picking the logs up and throwing them away. Some shove rifle you know, rifles through the holes. Some drop these jam team grenades through them. But uh, the most sensible approach was the men who went back, got in the communication trenches and assaulted the Turkish trenches from behind. Uh, hand to hand bloody combat uh, then started bayonets it's quite hard to use a rifle with a bayonet on it in, in a trench but uh, you can get a nice billy club and just beat someone to death with it uh, knives just fists there was brutal trench fighting started uh, and once the Australians had taken part of a trench they could safely remove the logs and just flood in and that's what happened the Australians basically just swarmed into these trenches and just massacred the Turks and the Turks smashed them back and the Australians eventually took all the trenches of Lone Pine uh, they then immediately very smartly decided that they needed reinforcements so they sent for reinforcements which came up and then the Turks basically waited until nightfall and then counterattacked. Uh, again brutal trench fighting happened the Australians threw them back the Turks came on again the next night and for the next sort of two or three nights it was basically a repeat of the same thing uh, during the day not much really happened you could see them coming you have these heaps of Vickers guns here for, for, for the time it was a lot of machine guns um, the Russians would have had more per battalion, but for a British for a British battalion at this point, you're rocking twice as many machine guns as you normally would. Uh, four whole machine guns per battalion. Uh, Australian light horse are deployed here, obviously on foot. Um, so yeah, you, you get this point of the Australians basically sorting themselves out, and they start putting a brigade here, battalion, uh, sorry, battalion here, battalion here, battalion there, and the Turks find out where two battalions meet. Um, one of the weakest points of the line is where your two conflicted command structures are right next to each other. So, you know who your lieutenant is and your captain and your major. You don't know who that guy's uh, command structure is. And when some guy dressed like a lieutenant starts giving orders, you don't know that he's dressed like a lieutenant. So you hear someone yelling and you look over, it's like, oh, that's an officer, I better do what he says, instead of instantly reacting to it. So, the point where two different uh, units meet is often the weakest point, And the Turks just smash that point. Uh, and so on the final night of the last real battle at Anzac, uh, at uh, Gallipoli, sorry, for the Anzacs, the Turks managed to push through the two battalions and get their way to the brigade command uh, command point, uh, where the brigadier general um, rallies the, the brigade uh, staff officers and typists and, and you know, just supply people, uh, arms them and then leads a counterattack against the Ottoman uh, brigade that had pushed through. So this Brigadier General is like leading a charge. Smith, I think his name was. Uh, leads a charge, rallies the men, and then basically the battalions converge on the side, pinch them off, and then the battalion <laughs> command staff come in and, and push them back. And the Turks basically, after this, they just give up. They're like, we're not going to take those trenches back. Um, Chunuk by here is another massacre. Uh, the, the New Zealanders end up doing quite well, but they just don't take the position you need to. Uh, it's very, very hard to take a position at Chunuk by here. It's got a very big slope, very open... Uh, and the Australians sort of screwed up a little bit because when the Australians attacked Lone Pine, men that were coming up, supposed to be coming up to Suvla, got diverted to Lone Pine and then ended up getting diverted down to Chunuk Paye. So the Australians basically accidentally lured people into the New Zealanders. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Whoops. How bad. Um, well, they're bad. Not how bad. They're bad. Uh, yeah. So, uh, whoops. Uh, after this, the, uh, the filthy, disgusting hot fly blown place turns into a filthy disgusting uh, snow and landslide slash mudslide place and people start dropping dead not from uh, the heat stroke and, and, and fly borne diseases but now they're dropping dead from frostbite they're getting drowned alive uh, flash flooding mudslides trenches just collapsing on people and, and basically burying them uh, this is the point where they really, really like, we have to get out of here. This is po completely pointless. We're much more used somewhere else. We have to get out. Uh, and they decide to evac evacuate the Anzacs at, um, and, the, and the British at Suvla first. Uh, 
partly because they were the easiest to get out, partly because if it all went wrong, then they, <laughs> the British and French would know what to do to not do it wrong. Uh, also, a, a big part of the reason that they pulled out was, remember I mentioned earlier that uh, Bulgaria was the reason that, uh, that the Germans and the Ottomans couldn't have a rail network to get supplies back and forth? Well, Bulgaria had just joined the Axis powers, so the Germans can now funnel supplies and troops down to the Ottomans by rail. Uh, the Serbs have just lost, basically they've just been, been wiped out and they're fleeing down. They were meant to meet up with a French uh, army group sent for them. The French literally just couldn't get there in time. They had to cross a massive river in a mountain range and they just had to sit there listening to the Serbs make their last stand. Uh, the Serbian king walking back and forth among the men in the trenches. Uh, then the Allies... <laughs> so the, the member of the British had gone into World War One because the Germans had dared, the German scum had dared to violate Belgian neutrality. And so the, the German scum who violated Belgian neutrality must be dealt with. So the British go in and, and sacrifice an entire generation's worth of youth for the principle of neutrality. And uh, these British who love neutrality so much invade Greece, <laughs> who is neutral, <laughs> and, and just take over Greece. <laughs> they don't technically invade. They just do everything that an invasion does without calling it an invasion. So it's not an invasion. Uh, they, invade, <laughs> they invade Greece. Uh, by the end of this, they will be demanding censoring of the press, uh, them censoring the press. Uh, they will demand the Greek flag not be flown and the Allied flag be flown. Uh, they will demand the Greek military uh, disarm. They will try and have, um, I believe it's the king who is pro-German and the government is pro-British or the other way around. They will, they will try and have a coup of some kind. Uh, they, ba they basically invaded Greece and then used it as a supply depot because, you know, it's this moral question of... of defending the rights of the neutral nations like when they defended Poland in World War II and then handed it over to the psychopathic mass murderer uh, but we can get into that later uh, so yes the, the allies have now invaded Greece for some reason <laughs> well for a very good reason but you can't yeah anyway the basic of the British just forfeited their whole moral like we got into World War One to save Belgium thing um, they got into World War One because they needed to get involved in World War One to save their own allies. They just couldn't legally justify doing it anyway. So they, they, they need to pull out now because there's suddenly like another four fronts have just opened up that they need troops for. They need to pull out. So the way, the most famous way they do this is they have silent periods at Anzac. They just complete silence, which if you know Australians and New Zealanders, must have been the hardest thing to do in this whole thing. Shut up, everybody. No one talks. And so after a couple of hours, some Turks would sort of creep forward. Just let them, let them come. And they sort of like, have they abandoned those positions? Let's let's do a small counterattack. And they counterattack, and you would open up with literally everything. You've got buckets of ammunition. You would just dump rounds just that way. Don't even aim for them. Unleash machine guns. Go crazy with them. Go nuts. Wear the rifles out. Who cares? Just fire rounds. We're going to leave them here anyway. And the Turks would be like, oh my goodness. They must have reinforced. There's like six times as many men there now. Look at the firepower they just put up to us when we attack. And the Turks sit back, and then they realize that silence is danger. Silence means danger. Silence means they're trying to lure us into a trap, so when they're silent, we won't go near them. But when they were silent, they were really practicing making the Turks afraid so that they could slip out. And between December 7th and December 28th, the Australians and New Zealanders left Anzac Cove in Suvla. Uh, one person died. Uh, a sailor died uh, when a magazine went off early. They, ba they basically set a bunch of mines and magazines and... Um, the most famous thing they have is a rifle with water. And so water would drip from a, from a top... I'll put a picture up. Water would drip from a top container into a bottom container. And when the bottom container got full, it would it would drop and pull the, pull the trigger on a rifle and fire it. Um, the, at Anzac Cove, they left behind quite a lot of um, ammunition, quite a lot of rifles. They just couldn't get it off, off the beach in time. So yeah, whatever, leave it there. That's why they didn't care that they were just firing rounds as many as they could because they couldn't get the ammunition off anyway. Might as well throw it at the Turks. Uh, they blow up a lot of ammunition before they left. They didn't really leave anything. Massacred any livestock they have left. Uh, they got artillery and just packed them full of explosives and blew them up. They smashed the wheels of all the vehicles and then they basically ran the engines and seized them up and then set them on fire. Yeah, just for good measure. The, they managed to get 36,000 men and 1,600 tons of supplies off Anzac Cove and Suvla, which is a huge effort, a monumental effort, to get that many supplies and, and men out of Suvla. Uh, the Hellas was a bit different because the Turks are like, oh, that's what you're about to do. And everyone says the, the Gallipoli evacuations were very successful. The Anzac and Suvla evacuations were very successful. Once the Turks realized what was going on, they had mass counterattacks at uh, the Hellas and they had to basically fight their way off the beaches. Um, not a huge amount of casualties, 
but they couldn't get away with it twice, um, which is unfortunate, but that's, that's just what happens. So the Anzacs were now out of action. They were sent back to Egypt to rearm and resupply. Volunteers came back over from Australia and they were ready to go over to the Western Front and the Light Horse. Most of the Light Horse would now stay in the Middle East. So that is the story of Anzac Day. That's where we get the Anzac Day from. 25th of April, 1915 is the first landings, four o'clock in the morning. And uh, to commemorate this, uh, Australians would normally gather at, um, at cenotaphs near RSL, surf clubs, that sort of thing. There's a beautiful one at, um, on the beach there. There's a huge one in Brisbane, in King George Square. Uh, no, is it King George Square? Anyway, there's, there's a huge one in Brisbane. Uh, every capital city will have a massive one. Um, so, yes, most Australians will gather for a dawn service or a, uh, a lunchtime service. Dawn service is much nicer. The lunchtime service is very... Um, so many speeches of people who don't matter. <laughs> like, no one... Uh, generic politician from local area 17. Does, does he really need to talk and say the same thing as everybody else? because he read the Wikipedia of what Anzac Day is last night, you know, come on. Um, but the dawn service is much nicer. It's much more uh, direct. Uh, they use the lunchtime service sometimes as like a recruiting thing. They'll get some modern person in the military up there and it's like, oh, it's great to be in the army. And sort of like, yeah, that's not what we're really here to talk about. But yeah, you know. Uh, Gallipoli is, is in our, it's in our blood at this point. It's in our psyche. Uh, Gallipoli is one of the most recognizable terms you'll, you can hear in Australia. Everyone sort of knows what Gallipoli means, but people don't really... Obviously, people don't know the whole like facts of what happened at Gallipoli. Uh, by the way, 8,000 Australian dead, 2,500 New Zealand dead, probably three times as many of that wounded. Um, no one really taken prisoner, as far as we know. There weren't a lot of prisoners taken. You were sort of, uh, you were sort of either dead or out of there. That was basically how it went. Um, so, yes. People, people know that Gallipoli was this big sort of landing on the beach last ditch defense and Simpson and the donkey and and the whole sneaking out there with the water rifles and that sort of stuff and uh, it was also the, it also scared the living crap out of the allies um, uh, to do uh, naval invasions the allies are like okay you can't do amphibious invasions with modern technology was which wasn't true um, there were other amphibious invasions done in World War two that did uh, World War one that did succeed uh, it scared the living crap out of the Australian I mean they're like oh wow we really suck at, at amphibious invasions. So in World War II, the Australian Army put a lot of effort, a lot of time and a lot of effort in World War II to perfecting uh, land, uh, uh, amphibious invasions. Uh, they were probably one of the best trained troops in the world for amphibious invasions. They had terrible, crappy landing craft. Why would they not put some money into landing craft? They were literally like plywood bottomed pieces of junk. But anyway, uh, the Australians wouldn't do another naval amphibious operation from uh, April 25th, 1915, up until September 1943, when uh, they basically, they had, were so petrified of doing another one because of Gallipoli, like Gallipoli haunted them. And uh, they landed in the wrong spot, and they're like, oh, it's Gallipoli again, we landed in the wrong spot, we're screwed. And they're like, okay, what did we do with Gallipoli? We, we got lost, and we scattered, and we didn't go inland. So what do we do here? We stay together, we follow the direction we're supposed to be going, and we leg it. And the Australians ended up being quite successful in that because they learned that when you land in the wrong spot, you don't stand around going, where are we? I don't know where I am. Where are my keys? You go, I need to be over there. Let's get over there as fast as possible with as many people as possible. And they gunned it and they were quite successful. So uh, lessons learned with a cost. Uh, probably the most famous person to be uh, booted out of out of position after uh, the, the overall commander of the the landing is a Gallipoli basically said, I'm not going to pull the men out because that'll hurt Britain's reputation. So Britain said, oh, cool, yeah. Uh, go and sit in the little um, penalty box for a while. We're going to get someone else in who's actually going to save people's lives. Uh, and then Churchill, of course, was uh, kicked out of the Admiralty. And he's like, well, screw you guys. I'm going to go and fight in the war. And as far as I'm aware, he's the only active serving cabinet member to ever fight in any war, um, as far as I know. He ended up joining up with a Scots regiment and actually went over the top a few times. He served three and a half months on the front lines in combat until his regiment was pulled out. Uh, at that time, they'd basically like, okay, okay, Winston, and they brought him back into the cabinet, uh, but not in a in an actual war position. But uh, yeah, as far as I know, Winston Churchill is not, he's not the only politician to ever fight in combat. That's that's not that's not true for the British, but he's the only active serving cabinet member of an actual prime minister to to join up voluntarily and fight. Um, 
So that is the story of Anzacs at Gallipoli. Seven VCs would be one at Lone Pine alone. Uh, two bar, this is five of my enlisted men. Uh, it, it, it has left a deep mark on Australia. Um, every year, 25th of, of April on Anzac Day, mass gatherings of people. Uh, especially now, back in the sort of 70s and 80s and, and early 90s, Anzac Day was very, very sparsely attended. Uh, that was the sort of hippie generation of, you know, anti-war, anti-this, and, and Australia had the same thing, people spitting on the soldiers. RSLs didn't recognize Vietnam vets. Um, so the Return Services League was supposed to look after the, you know, wounded, you know, the sort of guys who had come back from combat sort of turned away these Vietnam vets for sort of political reasons and all you guys were sort of police, not soldiers, and a lot of Australians have, have very mixed feelings about RSLs because of that, but not so much more nowadays. But back then it was quite a big deal about um, people didn't like RSLs for turning away Vietnam guys. People, <laughs> people didn't like some RSLs for letting in Vietnam guys. The whole thing was very politicized and very crazy, but uh, today... Yeah, huge, bigger, bigger crowds than ever uh, gather for Anzac Day. Although, sadly, of course, not this year uh, because of the COVID nineteen stuff. So everybody shut down. Uh, hence, why I'm doing this uh, this week of videos here. Uh, let's also to help the channel out. But you know, it's 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 the perfect time to talk about uh, Australian military in World War One and World War Two and the Boer War. So, what was the res what was the big overall result for the Australian Army and and after? after Gallipoli. I'm specifically talking about the Australian Army here, not New Zealand. New Zealand has a different military history to Australia, much more of a, an actual warfare history. Uh, 1830s, you have the Maori Wars, where <laughs> the Maori kings are like, can you stop selling guns to our people? Because they're really going to start some stuff that you don't want to be involved in. The British are like, oh no, we don't want to, we don't want to discriminate against people. We don't want to sell them. Well, discriminate against people is a bit tough. We don't want to we don't want to discriminate against people to sell them firearms. So you can have all the shotguns you like and then it's like, well, okay, well they're going to start some stuff. So the, the, the Maoris are very warlike people. Australian Aboriginals are very less warlike people. So the, um, the, the, Maori, uh, the New Zealand and Australian colonial like, conflict stuff is completely separate. Um, organised militaries in New Zealand, not so much in Australia. So in Australia, what was the result of this? Well, prior to World War I, uh, there were quite a lot of Australians who had connections with um, English battalions who were sort of like, I'm going to join the Australian Army until I get to France and then transfer to an English battalion somehow, or a Scots battalion, or British, or whatever. Because the Australian battalions were thought of as like third line garrison battalions, basically, because that's... People think of colonials as like the special forces nowadays, but we have to remember back in the day it was provincial troops suck, they're for garrisoning and guarding stuff, and that's it. I mean, yeah, you have guys like the Senegalese, who were sort of crazy close combat troops as the French thought of them. They were given machetes and, and all sort of stuff. The, the, the Gurkhas from India, of course, special forces type guys. Uh, Sikhs were often seen as very militaristic. That has more to do with the way how Indians view warfare rather than actual, you know, anything to do with the Sikhs in general. But that's another huge issue. So the Gallipoli really cemented the idea that all oh, of these Australians will actually fight. They will actually stand their ground and fight. Um, they're, they're, they're not going to just be pushovers. So we can use them as elite divisions. And that's basically what they got designated. Technically, so basically you had three sorts of divisions. Holding divisions, which are your third line support. Um, regular divisions, which would do three month rotation. So you'd be on the front line for three months, switch out for three months, come back, switch out. And then elite divisions, which would be in the front line for six to nine months. Um, they could be trusted to hold. They could be trusted to do these big attacks. And so not all, not all Australian divisions got put on that, but a lot of them did. And um, they got up there with things like the guards and the, the inner skillings and things like big these divisions with a lot of um, these regiments with a lot of history behind them. And uh, yeah, that, this basically cemented the idea that the Australians were not going to be relegated to the third line. They're in fact going to be front and center um, in a lot of big actions that are coming ahead. And we'll talk about those in the next uh, few days this week. So thanks very much for watching. I know it's been quite long, but uh, thank you very much for watching and have a wonderful day.